I'm going to talk about a little story uh, with Jesus to, to start um, a subject tonight. How many of you have heard the phrase, kingdom now, but not yet? Kingdom now, but not yet. It's a wonderful truth. I first heard it, goodness, I think it was in the early 80s. And it was from a wonderful, wonderful apostolic leader from Buffalo, New York, uh, Tommy Reed. Uh, just a wonderful man. He wrote a book. He dealt with the subject. And the reality uh, of the subject is, is really in the title. The kingdom of God is a present reality, but it's also a coming reality. And so we live in the tension of these two things. The phrase ignited me when I first heard it. But to be honest, in recent years, it's frustrated me. In early years, it was used to describe what was possible now because Jesus would perform a miracle and then he would say, the kingdom of God has come upon you. He wasn't talking about a future event. He was saying, listen, the manifestation of that kingdom, the realm of his dominion, has been demonstrated in the healing or the deliverance of this person. And so he would join together a demonstration of power with the reality or the existence of the kingdom of God. And he did this over and over and over again. And so when I first heard the phrase, it excited me because because it gave language to what we were starting to experience and starting to end up really to hunger for. It was the reality of God's dominion that Jesus preached and demonstrated. In recent years, the only time I hear the phrase is to describe what we can't have now. Don't be one of those. Don't let the not yet be the hiding place of your unbelief. We sometimes find excuses for why things don't happen instead of find breakthrough. Because excuses are easier to come by than breakthrough. One of my favorite stories in this regard is in Mark chapter 9, and it's where Jesus, or excuse me, where a dad with his son brings this child to the disciples for deliverance. He's tormented by demons. The demons throw him in the fire and the water, try to kill him. And as any dad would, at, he's absolutely desperate for some sort of an answer, a solution for his son. And they bring this child to the disciples. Now, lest we become arrogant and mock the disciples for not getting it, they were the most developed and trained people in healing and deliverance of anyone to ever live up until that time, second only to Jesus. Jesus actually trusted them to go to their own cities without him being with them. And he sent them two by two to their own hometowns, the hardest places to minister, hometowns. And they brought a manifestation of the kingdom, powerful miracles, powerful deliverance. So much so that the disciples end up arguing who was most important. It followed that experience of seeing breakthrough in their hometown. And so they come back with Jesus. This man brings a child to them to be delivered. And the, tr- and the disciples try everything they've ever tried before, I'm sure. And to no avail, they could not bring deliverance and healing to this child. And Jesus came along and saw that they weren't getting breakthrough. And he said, you know, how long am I going to be with you? And, and he said, he said, oh, you of unbelief. So he actually attached the absence of their breakthrough to their faith. And then he brought deliverance to the child. Now, the disciples saw this. And what I love about this story is they were unwilling to create a theology around what didn't happen. See, much of our theology today is actually developed around what didn't happen. If the pool of Bethesda were to happen today, one person out of a thousand was healed. They say as many as a thousand could have been waiting around that pool. It was common for a thousand people to be there. And so one person was healed. The Bible celebrates the healing of the one, 
but many pastors, theologians, newspaper interviewers, TV people would be interviewing the other 999 and asking them this question. What did it feel like to have Jesus walk past you and heal someone else? The theologians would come to the conclusion that this in itself is evidence that it's not God's will to heal everyone because our theology is often developed around what didn't happen. And the disciples refused to do that. And when they saw this deliverance, the Bible says, they took Jesus aside and they asked him, how was it they could, if I can put it in my language now, how was it we could have such breakthrough in the past, but in this case, we didn't. And Jesus said, this kind only comes out with prayer, by prayer and fasting. Most of us, when we read that, we come to the conclusion that the hard ones come out with prayer and fasting, that the key to the breakthrough is prayer and fasting. It's a good lesson to learn. It's a lesson that Jesus gave them. But the lesson that I take away from the story is that when you don't get a breakthrough, you take Jesus aside. Because in this situation, it may be prayer and fasting. In this situation, it may be a right declaration. In this situation, it may be a sacrificial prophetic act. The point is, is we don't create a lifestyle around what doesn't happen and then assume that's God's will. Amen, Bill. Good point. Excellent. Amen. All right. Don't quit. Keep going. All right, how many of you understand that we have, we have dual citizenship? We are citizens of earth. Yes. We are citizens right now of heaven. Jesus actually made one of the most unusual statements in John 3. He, he said, nobody has ascended to heaven except the Son of Man who now is in heaven, and he's standing on planet Earth. You can look through the windows of your earthly home and see situations, or you can look through the windows of your heavenly home. If you have hope and faith, you're looking through your heavenly home. If you have anxiety and fear, you're looking through your earthly home. Your perception is determined by where you're seated. If you're seated in Christ in heavenly places, you don't have to psych yourself to believe something. You actually see. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. The implication is, is when we're converted, he opens to us the capacity to see the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter 5, we have a, a beautiful story. I'm sorry, let me finish my comments on the dual citizenship. Both hope and hopelessness are contagious. Both hope and hopelessness are contagious. Decide the influence you want to have on the world around you. You never have to psych yourself into hope when you see through Jesus' eyes. Because every problem he has a redemptive answer for. 